church and I'm excited because I get to do what I love and that's what God created us to do. I think it takes everybody being aware of those sitting next to them or somebody who's lingering in the back that maybe doesn't want to uh, fully participate yet, um, but getting to know those people and welcoming them in, um, I think is who we are. Community forms us into the likeness of Jesus because we have to die to ourselves and we have to love others even when it's hard. It's not always gonna be fun. A lot of it's gonna be messy. Everybody has their stuff in life. And if we can be real with each other and walk alongside of each other, that's what this church is all about. If you go on faith, and you believe God's got a bigger plan for this community, and you pray and you seek and you let him lead it, I think God could go all over this nation with, with, with something like this, so certainly in, in the Northwest Iowa region. At Living Water, we seek to follow Jesus by loving God and loving others. At Living Water, we seek to follow Jesus by loving God and loving others. At Living Water, uh, we strive to follow Jesus by loving God and loving others. Welcome church, if everyone can please uh, find your seats and please stand and uh, we'll get the service started with some, some worship.
more time. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, Brothers and sisters in Christ, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. You can go ahead and have a seat. My name is Gary. I'm one of the pastors here at Living Water Community Church. At Living Water, we seek to follow Jesus by loving God and loving others. Today, especially, we're going to focus on that word follow. We're going to try to understand what it means to leave an old life behind and to follow Jesus completely. Now, you may have noticed a couple of things laying around. These are balloons. And who can be upset when there's a balloon around? This is something that is exciting, something that shows that there's a party happening. It's something that shows that there's something good happening. And as we've been going over the last few weeks through this series called Love Does, one of the things that the author of that series, Bob Goff, shows and tells is just simply giving a balloon. Why not? Just because. And he does this because love does. And so he'll hand out balloons just to create a smile, just to spread a little bit of love. And that's what I want to follow today. A question, why not? Why would I not follow Jesus completely? Why would I not leave behind that old life? Why would I not give everything I am to follow him? But I recognize that our human nature is strong. I recognize that our traditions, our old beliefs, our old lives are strong. And so we struggle sometimes to give up our old self. We struggle sometimes to follow Jesus completely. And so we need the blessing of his Holy Spirit to break those chains. We need the blessing of his Holy Spirit to be among us here, even to hear his invitation. And so would you join me in prayer as we ask an overwhelming outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray together. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are God and we are not. You are holy, holy, holy. We stand in awe of who you are. We stand in awe of what you have done. You created you set this whole earth in motion. You set this whole universe in place. And you didn't leave. You aren't one who just created and, and left us on our own. You are a God who cares about us so incredibly deeply that you walked this earth in your son, Jesus Christ. You care about us so incredibly much that you don't want to leave us where we were. You don't want to leave us in sin. You don't want to leave us to fend for ourselves. God, you loved us so much that you sent your son that whoever believes in you will not perish but have eternal life. God, we thank you for that invitation this morning. We thank you for your call to follow you. Would we heed that this morning? Would we hear that this morning? Would we recognize that you are reaching out to us through song, through scripture, through words, through prayer? God, you are reaching out to us. Your Holy Spirit is here, is living and active. And so we ask for the ears to hear. We ask for the eyes to see. We ask for the ability to know that you are inviting us to join you this morning. We need your Holy Spirit to see that. We need your Holy Spirit to hear that. We need your Holy Spirit. So bless this time that we have together. May it be pleasing in your sight. May it be holy in your sight. In your incredible name, we pray. Amen. 
Before you stand and greet one another, I'll give you a reminder of these cards that are on your seats, the cards that are at the uh, back of the worship center there. If you have an email address that has changed, if this is your first time visiting, if you have a prayer concern, if you have any question about what living water is, about the God that we serve, any of that, just put that on the back and drop that in the offering basket later in the service when that goes around. Why don't we stand and greet one another as God has greeted us us this morning. invite you to come up on stage while the grown-ups are finding their seat. My name, children, come on up on stage this morning. We have something special for you. And while the adults are finding their seats, I just want to introduce myself. I am Sue. I work with the children. You guys can sit on the stage, okay? You're going to look up at the screen. So children, come on up, sit down. Parents, thank you very much for bringing your kids to church. We appreciate it. My name is Sue. I work with the children here at Living Water. And this year we're doing a new series. The series we're doing this year is called What's in the Bible? Come on up, kids. And um, this series is written by Phil Vischer. Uh, Phil Vischer was known for creating Veggie Tales. And now he is on to another series. It's actually been around for about three years. It's called What's in the Bible? And so these kids have learned so many great things about the Bible and answers to questions that we thought we would bring you five minutes. Adults, come on. Kids, come on up. Adults, you get to be a kid for five minutes. Just sit back in your chair, relax, enjoy. We're going to watch five minutes of the video that the kids are going to watch today. You guys have not seen this yet, so turn around and watch. You've been practicing this song, You Can't Stop a Train. You saw it at home. This is on Right Now Media, so some of the kids have seen it, um, but we haven't watched it yet. We have been, we're, this is the seventh episode, and um, basically Phil Vischer walks us through the Bible, and we've learned about um, creation, we learned about sin, and now we're following, the Israelites are um, about to go into the promised land, but before they go into the promised land, they have to, um, they have to go fight. And so there's a tough question that comes out, and there's two questions. One question is, why was it okay to take land that someone else was living in, it wasn't theirs. And the second question is, why is it okay to kill? Because thou shalt not kill is one of the Ten Commandments. So these are tough questions even for adults, and they're going to answer it, but you get to sit back, relax, be a kid, enjoy being entertained. And then at the end, when the song comes on, kids, then you need to stand up, turn around, and face the audience. All right, here we go. Be a kid, enjoy. Yep. That usually means you're developing a big question. Yep. Okay, what is it? Lots of people died. What do you mean? In all those battles, the Israelites killed lots of people. Did God want them to die? Oh my, that is a very tricky question. I guess it's time for... Tricky Bits with Beth Denver! Buck isn't here right now. Please leave a message after the beep. Beep. And now it's time for Tricky Bits with Phil. This is one of the trickiest bits in the whole Bible. When the Israelites entered the land of Canaan, there were already people living there, and they didn't want to leave. Most of those people eventually were killed by the Israelites. 
So why was it okay for the Israelites to take land from other people? And how could it possibly be okay for the Israelites to kill them to get it? That's right. Killing and stealing are things we aren't supposed to do. Well, first, taking the land. Whose land was it? It belonged to the people who lived there. Really? Who made the land? Who made the whole world? Who made the universe? God did. Oh, right. So whose land was it? It was God's. Right. Say you have a toy. You let your friend play with your toy. But after a while, another friend asks if they can try the toy. So you take it back and let your other friend try it. Do you have the right to do that? Sure you do. It's your toy. Right. And if your friend refuses to give the toy back, who is wrong? Your friend is. It wasn't his toy in the first place. Exactly. If the entire universe belongs to God, God has every right to take a piece of land from one group of people and give it to another. Well, that makes sense. But what about the killing? Right. Why did those people deserve to die? This is the trickiest part of all. But it all comes down to sin. Who has sinned? Adam and Eve started it, but then, well, everybody. Right. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul says we have all sinned and fall short of God's standard, God's glory. God has a standard for holiness, for how we should behave. Some of us can do better than others, and we feel pretty good about ourselves. But God's standard is so high, none of us can even come close. So we're all sinners. That's right. You, me, everyone. And what do we deserve when we sin against a holy God? What have we earned? I'm thinking not a time out, Roy. That's right. Paul says the wages of sin, what we've earned when we sin against a holy God, is death. So we all have earned death. Yep. So the Egyptians who were killed by the plagues. They got what they had earned. And the Israelites who were swallowed by the ground. They got what they had earned. And the people of Canaan who stood against God, who said he couldn't have that land, who had worshipped other gods, who had even sacrificed their children to other gods. They got what they had earned. That's right. So the real question isn't why did the people of Canaan get what they deserved? The real question Question. If we've all sinned, and sin deserves death, why haven't we all gotten what we deserve? Because God loves us. He launched his rescue plan to save as many as possible from the death we deserve. The people of Egypt who were holding the Israelites as slaves. The Israelites who told God his rescue plan was wrong. The people of Canaan who tried to stop God from giving the Israelites that land. They were all standing in the way of God's rescue plan. Thinking you can stop God's rescue plan is a little bit like thinking you can stop a freight train by standing in front of it. It's not very smart, and you're probably going to get hurt. So, do you have a song for that? Uh, well, let's see. Hmm, that's a tricky one. Okay, how about this? You can't stop a train by standing in the track. You can't stop an avalanche by yelling, Hey, turn back! And standing in the way of what God is gonna do will be really, 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 really not so good for you. Can I help out Jack and Pete? Well, I can't stop a boat by holding out your hand. Can I stop a boat from with the love of
to start something. Call us to stop something. Tap us on the shoulder to give us your message over and over again. Help us to not miss it, God. Help us not miss how you are speaking this morning. In your holy name we pray. Amen. And so I asked a few of you to kind of be thinking about this, to set an example for us. And if uh, I was asking you, then you're willing to raise your hand and, and tell a little bit about uh, what the Love Does study has been doing for you. I also uh, thought through this, uh, some of you are concerned about uh, having to be in front of the camera. Uh, hello, Facebook world. Uh, some of you are concerned about if I share too much or whatever. So I'm going to leave the camera facing this way. We're not going to turn the camera and, uh, and look at you as you're talking. So you will have some anonymity there. And if you do so desire, if you just want it to stay in this room, then you can do it without the microphone. And just this room will hear it, obviously. Uh, so what happened during the last five weeks? What was affecting you? through the Love Does study. And so the camera is going to see this. Don't worry about the Facebook world. They're just seeing the Love Does logo. But tell me a little bit about what God has been tapping you on the shoulder with, uh, what the Love Does study has done for you and for your family. You pointing over there or are you pointing over here? Okay. Um, this is Carol. <laughs> <laughs> well, now everybody I, I thought, knows. No, that, I don't yeah, care. So I don't, I don't care. Right. I'm not going to share any deep, dark secrets. Um, I guess I just thought that what I had to say was sort of an introductory part to some things that you're asking for. And those of you who um, know Ellen and I, you know that we've done Bible studies off and on our whole married life. I was going to say a number like almost 50 years, but that would be too scary. But um, And I guess my point by saying that is when we were, um, when we felt that we wanted to get involved with this, we were still nervous. Mm -hmm. You know, even though we've done this our whole life and it's kind of a lifestyle for us, we were nervous about getting a group of people together who had never been together. We wondered, uh, would they talk? Would they connect? Would it be boring? 
we just you just never know mm -hmm. but what we've discovered um, as we gathered around the table for a light or not so light lunch uh, or dinner and we happened to have um, Giovanni in our group so uh, we had some lovely Italian food served some <laughs> evenings um, but what we discovered is that um, God when God puts people together there's there's laughter um, there's stories shared of our lives. Some of them are funny stories. Some of them are tragic stories. But it combines to be just a whole lot of fun. And then when we reconvened over in the, the cozy room in front of the uh, fake fireplace, um, and we read about Jesus, and we talked about Jesus restoring Peter after he had sinned by denying him, and we talked about Jesus calming the storm on the Sea of Galilee. Um, and we, we talked about this amazing verse from 1 John. Dear friends, since God loved us so, we ought to love one another. Mm -hmm. Stuff happens, and God works, and people opened up, and people shared. And I got to know people I'd never known before. That's and awesome. it was really beautiful. I'm going to just I know I'm taking longer than my share. I'm sorry. <laughs> but... Um, you know, a retired school teacher has to prepare, right? And this right, is what right. happens. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but it was kind of fun because the first night that we met together, we asked people, the materials asked people to, to ask, to put down a one or two words of what they were looking for and what they were expecting. And I'm going to read some of these words. Mm -hmm. Friendship, connections, wisdom, community, how to love better, fellowship, courage, and acceptance. And I guess my final statement is that God gave all of this to us and more. Amen. So we loved it. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you. What else we got for what love does did? Um, yeah, I also thought as a group level, it was really cool to see people that I haven't seen talk to each other before coming together and talking to each other even after church and stuff. Um, but when Gary asked me to talk, I kind of thought of it on a personal level, and I saw it on page 65 of the guidebook. It says, Jesus says, let's go and do stuff, and we'll find out who I am and who you are along the way. And I kind of feel like that that's what this study did for me, was to discover where I'm at and who I am right now. Um, and it helped you check in. There was four sessions um, to check in on a deeper level. How are you as a quitter? Do you have too much stuff in your life? Are you able mm -hmm. to quit? Um, how, are, how do you handle failure? Um, as a perfectionist, fail, failing is hard. Mm -hmm. But experiment um, to set myself up to fail was really cool because I actually failed and I was still proud of doing what I did. So mm -hmm. it's actually mm -hmm. a different feeling to fail on purpose. Um, audacious love, you know, how open are you um, to letting God come into your heart so that love overflows to others and fear how are you with fear are you who you want to be um so he kind of sets up this formula of each session of checking in so i felt like i was able to check in with myself in all of those sessions and then he follows it up with hearing god's word um, we had sermons we had scripture through the guide um, and then there's the action and that action is very important. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that sometimes we skip. And, but that action is going back to checking in. If you're not where you want to be, that action is the only way to get that change. Mm -hmm. um, so call me silly, but I liked how he did the, the formula there. So I decided that I'm being asked, um, Jesus asked me to doing the cha-cha. Check in, hear God's word action and mm. repeat nice so i came up with that and i'm like well maybe that's an easy way because i think that's a great formula to remember all the time mm -hmm. you know you can check in with these sessions he had um in a couple months in a couple years just keep checking in keep hearing god's word and keep doing action that's so. awesome i really thought you were going to get up and dance too <laughs> like, oh boy here we go cha-cha awesome awesome what else has God been doing through these last five weeks as we have focused on love does? We've got a couple of examples, so now you know how to talk. You can speak. It's okay. 
Here we go. I think in this study, it was a reminder for me after doing a Bible study called Experiencing God. Mm. And what I had gotten out of that study was um, what we seek to do here at Living Water. You seek to find where God is working and then join him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this has been, um, yeah, that was many years ago, but this is a wonderful reminder. Why wouldn't you want to join Amen. God? Why wouldn't you want to, right? Yep. What are you being tapped on the shoulder with that God wants you to share that you experienced over the last few weeks? So I've been reminded uh, to love others and to let that change my schedule. Mm. Uh, so someone called me to this past week and said, um, hey, I have somebody here who needs some prayer. Could you come over? And I'm like, oh, man, I'd love to come, but I've got Bible study. Mm. <laughs> so I'm like, well, that's a pretty good reason. I can't go. So um, and <laughs> went to Bible study, came home, and I thought, really, really? I, what would have happened if I had gone and prayed with that person? Mm. What would have happened? I'm, we might have started a new friendship. We might have maybe opened up somebody's eyes or opened up my eyes to something else. Mm -hmm. What would have happened if I would have gone to Bible study late? Nothing. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of what, yeah. Right. So it was just a good reminder to me that... Uh, just to remember what's more important, loving people. Right, right. Thank you for sharing that. Because it's not always as we're going around, like, quote, unquote, success stories. Sometimes I recognize that I missed an opportunity, right? And maybe that's what you're being tapped on the shoulder with. So that next time it doesn't happen again, that you don't miss that opportunity. Anybody else with what stuck out to you over the last few weeks? from the Love Does study. The challenge for this week was to reach out to somebody you don't know. Mm. I went and picked up uh, Donnie to come to church and on, along the gravel road there was a guy walking and we stopped and picked him up mm -hmm. and said, where do you need to go? And he said he just wanted to go to the to the trailhead a half mile away. Mm -hmm. And as we talked, he had just been coming from church, found out that he's a Christian guy, mm -hmm. talked about that we were going to church, and it was just a neat experience. Just, mm -hmm. just didn't take much. Right, right. But why not, right? Why not? One more example or one more tap on the shoulder of what uh, God has been showing you, revealing to you through the Love Does study through the last few weeks. This side of the room is representing really, really well. This side of the room, we could have somebody talk. There's one. See, way to go this side of the room. I knew you could do it. I haven't been around for very long. Been away from my job. And... God tapped me on the shoulder this morning and says, I think it's time to go back to the Lord, mm. go back to my friends and family. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Amen. And he's also tapped me on the shoulder and woke me up in a relationship. Mm -hmm. And I think it's for the best. Amen. Amen. So God's never given up on me. I don't think I'll ever give up on him. Amen. Thank you very much. And so all of this has been pointing towards this final session, towards this understanding of following Jesus. We have several examples throughout Scripture, especially uh, in the Israelite history, especially 
uh, as he's calling them his people, several examples of where he asked them to follow. We see it even clearer as Jesus Christ comes as his only begotten son. If you remember several of the stories of the early calling of the disciples, uh, he walked along and he saw them fishing. He saw them doing their thing and he said, come and follow me. And they drop their nets and they go. We see this a couple times throughout uh, as he's giving these deep, deep lessons, as he's doing these things that are going to require people to drop what they were doing. And most of the time we actually see these examples of it happening. We see the examples of people dropping their profession, of dropping the thing that's going on in that very moment and following Jesus. But every once in a while we see that they don't. Maybe they don't drop what they were doing. Maybe they don't drop everything that was their livelihood. Maybe they don't leave their family behind. Maybe they don't leave all of their livelihood behind. And that's what we see in Luke 18. I want to look for just a few minutes at the rich young ruler. And we have several Gospels that give us different glimpses of this passage. And that leads us to know that this was a well-to-do person. This was somebody who had a lot of resources in his pocket, a lot of resources in the bank account. We also hear from another Gospel that he was a young man, that he was probably right around the 35, 40-year-old range because he had advanced that far in his uh, well-being. He had advanced that far in what he was doing. And we also know from another gospel that he was a ruler, that he had people under him, that he had some clout to him. And so all of that being said, he comes up to Jesus and asks him a question. And I want you to notice right away the fact that he even came to Jesus shows that he understands a little bit of what is happening. He shows that he needs something. And, and, and as he asks this question, I want you to also think of the fact that uh, so many interactions that Jesus has with other people, so many interactions that he has with the Pharisees, with the Sadducees, with all of these other rulers, they were embarrassed to come to Jesus. Remember, we uh, heard from Nicodemus not too long before this, and Nicodemus came in the dead of night to make sure that no one else was going to see him. But this guy is different. This guy says, I'm going to go in the daylight. I'm going to go when other people can see me, and I'm going to ask him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And so what I want you to realize is that this guy has got some things going for him in terms of his Christianity, in terms of knowing that Jesus Christ is someone that I can get an answer from. But in verse 19, Jesus kind of sees through some of this question and sees through the fact that he's really just looking for one prize. He's really just looking for one goal. He asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And I want you to be absolutely clear that even this guy's question is off base, right? Even this guy's question is missing the big picture kind of point. Because as we know from our studies on grace, as we know from the logistical understanding of the fact that we don't do anything to inherit eternal life, it's all a gift given from Jesus Christ. By faith alone in Jesus Christ are we saved. By grace alone alone are we saved? And so even his question is just a little bit off. And Jesus answers, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. And you shall honor your father and your mother. In good religious language, in good rule-keeping ways, this guy says, hey, all of those things that you just told me to do, I've done all of that. All these I have kept since I was a boy. And so pay attention and maybe even equate yourself with this guy. Understand that he is trying to follow the rules enough. He's trying to show that he has done enough. He's trying to give the understanding that I've kept all of these rules. I've done all of these things and so obviously, I'm on the right track. When Jesus heard this, now we're in verse 22. Verse 22, when Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. 
Sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Then you will have treasure in heaven. Now from the other gospels, we know that the response is something that saddened the man. The response is something that gives him a pause and gives him a recognition of what he cannot do. Now, all kinds of commentators will look at this and and they'll take it word for word and they'll say, okay, so then if we are in that same boat, if we are asking that same thing, then obviously the question has to be exactly answered the same way. But I want you to look at the big picture with me here. I want you to understand that whatever this one thing is for him is not necessarily the one thing for you. Let me say that another way. Whatever it is that you were tapped on the shoulder with as we're reading through this passage, whatever it is that came to your mind, whatever relationship you haven't forgiven, whatever thing you are holding as the most important, whatever issue you are saying, that's something that I'm not going to bend on. That's something that I'm not going to give to Jesus. That's something that I'm not going to leave behind. That's something that is either too much time for me or too much effort or too much money. Whatever it is, that's the one thing that I really truly believe the Holy Spirit is tapping you on the shoulder with and asking you to answer in this same way. Maybe it means giving up that relationship. Maybe it means stopping that addiction that you were caught in. Maybe it means selling everything you have. I don't know, and I trust that the Holy Spirit is translating what I'm saying now so that you can hear that in your own life. You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have. Give it to the poor, and then you will have treasure in heaven. And here's the tagline that I want to hold over and over and over again. Come, follow me. How simple and how complex and how difficult and how easy and how mind-blowing is this simple idea. Just follow Jesus. It's in our stinking words for crying out loud. Follow Jesus by loving God and loving others. Man, that seems easy. Until you're asked to be the one who gets ridden over in some kind of relationship. Until you're asked to be the one who stands up and shares about what the Love Does study has done for you. Until you're asked to step outside of your comfort zone and pick somebody up that needs a ride. Until you're asked to do what Jesus would have done in whatever situation is coming to your mind at this moment. That's where the rubber meets the road. That's where come, follow me becomes real. Come and follow me. I had the opportunity to uh, spend the weekend last weekend with prisoners. Uh, I was gone. Sam Ashmore was here preaching, and uh, we uh, did this Brothers in Blue thing where you go in for the weekend, and you obviously listen to testimonies, and you talk about Jesus Christ, and you see the transformation in people's lives happen. And as we did that, as we went through that, one of the things that I was utterly aware of was how the numbers kept going down throughout the weekend. Everybody was so excited because we started with some 130 people in a small chapel on Friday night or whenever it was, uh, Friday morning, whenever it was that we started. And people were kind of slapping each other on the back almost and getting excited because, man, this is the most guys we've ever had. This is going to be a a huge weekend. This is going to be a transformational weekend. And as we went through Friday, as we went through Saturday, as we went into Sunday, those numbers kept going down and down and down. And we finished the weekend with somewhere around 70 guys. And as people were kind of maybe thinking of that as a failure, as people were kind of looking around like, oh man, there's a lot more room in the seats now. We don't have quite as many guys. This must not have been an effective thing. The passage that kept coming to my mind was right before this, Jesus is actually explaining how uh, communion is going to work. He's actually explaining what it's going to mean to follow Jesus. He said something along these lines, you're going to have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And the reaction to that is that many disciples desert Jesus. And so he looks at the ones that remain 
And he says, aren't you going to leave too? Aren't you understanding how hard this is? Aren't you understanding that the words, come, follow me, mean that you die to yourself? They mean that you pick up your cross. They mean that you don't get your way. What if those words are still true today? What if it really actually means that when we hear come and follow Jesus, or when we say I follow Jesus by loving God and loving others, what if that means I'm different? I'm different than what I used to be. I don't look for my own good anymore. I don't look for what's going to benefit me. I don't look for what's going to be easier for me. I don't even look for what's best for my family. I look at what's best for Jesus Christ. I look at what's best for the kingdom of God. And I guarantee you that if this is the first time you hear that, if this is the first time you hear that, then I'm going to do like the credit card offer where there's the fine print is right there, but I'm going to blow that fine print up and I'm going to say, you know what following Jesus means? It means you die to yourself. It means that you don't get your way, but it means that you find a better way. When we follow Jesus by loving God and loving others, we are shown and we are told that it's the only way. It means that you might not have the biggest house. It means that you might not get what you want. It means that you might have a busy schedule that gets completely blown up. But I can also tell you it's worth it. As he tells this to the rich young ruler as he tells that guy that, hey, you're going to have to sell everything you have because he sees through that rich young ruler's life and he knows what it is that he is holding as so important. And he says, that's what I want you to give up. I want you to open your hand so that it becomes mine. And the rich young ruler turns away because it's too much for him to give up. It's too much for him to offer and he actually says right after our passage in Luke how impossible it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And commentators will say that's just about money. That's just about all of these, uh, the, the possessions that we have. But the reality is what most historians will find is that he's talking to us about whatever it is that you are holding on to. You see, richness can happen in a whole lot of different ways. You can be money rich. You can have all kinds of resources. But maybe, just maybe, he's talking about how rich you are in time, how rich you are in blessing, how rich you are with a family, how rich you are with a house, whatever it is understand that he's saying those things can easily stand in your way and what I want to ask you today is what are you holding back is it a relationship is it a resource is it a schedule is it something that you have been holding on to that you are not willing to give up for the kingdom of God you see, if that was the first time you heard about Jesus Christ being an option for your Lord and Savior, the only option for your Lord and Savior, then that's good news. That's mind-blowing news. But maybe you've heard that before. In fact, I'm guessing a majority listening, a majority here have heard the fact before that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. But sometimes what that gives us the opportunity to do then is to say, I'm going to give most of my life. I'm going to give most of what I am. I'm going to give most of my schedule. I'm going to follow Jesus, but I'm also going to chase this American dream. I'm going to follow Jesus, but I'm also going to hold up my family as an idol. And this is what that rich young ruler tries to do. He tries to hold on to both of these things. I want my money and I want eternal life. And Jesus Christ says, no, you can't serve two masters. You can't do both of these things. You can't have a foot in both camps. It's all or nothing in terms of following Christ. And what I want to ask you today is, are you answering the same way that that rich young ruler answered? Are you holding something back? The uh, Roman soldiers uh, back in uh, early Christianity days used to uh, believe that baptism was salvific. Uh, baptism is what would save you. 
And so they would have this understanding that when I go into the water and I come back up, I'm saved. And everything that that water touches is what saves. And now we, of course, understand that that is not what saves you. It's only Jesus Christ that saves you. But I want to use their analogy for something. Because what they would do is hold their hand out of the water. And the reason they would do that is because they knew that as a soldier, I'm going to go to battle and I'm going to have to kill with this hand. I'm going to have to stab with this sword. I'm going to have to defend with this shield. I am going to kill with this hand. And so what they would do is say, all of me is clear. All of me is clean. All of me is Jesus Christ except this one hand. And so dunk me in, but I'm going to hold this hand up. What I want to use as an analogy there is have you been holding something up? Knowing that it's Jesus Christ that permeates this entire body, knowing that it's Jesus Christ that saves this entire body, have you been doing your offering during the offering times with holding your checkbook out of the water, so to speak? Have you been going through this life with holding your calendar, holding your house, holding your money, holding a relationship out of this money? Jesus, you can have all of this, but this is mine. This is something I'm holding on to. What would it be like to offer that to him? What would it be like to say completely, God, I am yours? We have an opportunity to be reminded of that this morning. We have an opportunity to celebrate this thing called communion, this thing called the Last Supper, this thing called the Lord's Supper. And what this does is remind us that as surely as I hold this bread, as surely as I drink this cup, that's how sure I can be that Jesus Christ died for me, all of me. I come as a broken person. I come as someone who is not having all of my life figured out. I come as someone who is messy and broken and sinful. And I confess that to Jesus Christ. And I say, I need you so desperately. I need you so much that I can't do this life on my own. I confess you as my Lord and as my Savior. This bread, this cup, that's not what saves us. But it points to Jesus Christ. It reminds us of how far he went on the cross. It reminds us of the fact that that cross is empty. It reminds us of the fact that he spent three days in the grave and that he did not stay there. It reminds us of the fact that we serve a living Savior in Jesus Christ. When we celebrate this meal, when we celebrate what this represents, when we celebrate this sign and this seal, we see that this bread goes into my mouth and it breaks apart and it becomes a part of my muscles. It becomes a part of my fiber. It becomes a part of my being. It goes everywhere in my body. It's my heart, my soul, my mind, everything that is touched with the work of Jesus Christ. He asks us then to deny ourselves, to leave behind that old life and to not take this lightly and to say, this is just another meal, this is no big deal. He tells us instead that this is something that is holy. This is something that is meaningful. This is something that is real. And so as a living water community church as a a church in the reformed tradition we hold this meal as something that is special we hold this meal that is something that is holy knowing that the holy spirit blesses these elements that the holy spirit makes this a special meal for us We look at the past, at what he has done. We look at the present, the fact that his Holy Spirit is here. We look at the fact that his Holy Spirit is in each one of us. And so as I look at your eyes, when you take that bread off, I see the image of God. As you look at whatever station you're at, as you look at that bread, as you look at that person in the eyes, you can see that God is here. 
And you can know that all around the world, at our other campus in Sheldon, at churches around Orange City, at churches around Iowa, at churches around the world, they are doing this same thing. And that ties us together with them. And that makes us one. But it's not just past, it's not just present. You look forward and you understand that this is a down payment, that this is something that is just a glimpse, something that is just a preview. You see, right now we see in part, because of sin, we have these shades over our eyes. We have these blinders on that we can't quite grab on to everything that Jesus Christ is. But we see little glimpses We see little glimpses of what he is doing. We see little glimpses of heaven on earth. We see little glimpses of thy kingdom come. And we know that someday we have a promise that he will come again. Someday we will not exist in this sin. Someday we will not exist where there are tears, where there are sadness, where there is loss, where there is pain. Someday we will be reunited with him. And so we look forward to the fact that we will have this meal face to face with him. We look back, we look at the present, and we look forward, celebrating what it is that Jesus Christ has done, what he is doing, and what he will do. Will you join me as we ask a blessing on this meal together? Let's pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, because of you, we have this meal. Because of you, we have communion. I pray that you would bless this time that we have. May it be something that is a sign. May it be something that is a seal. May it be something that points to our salvation in you alone. As those who believe in you as our Lord and Savior, we join together with those around the world. We join together with you this morning. Bless this time that we have together. Make it holy. Make it special. In your name we pray. Amen. And so on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said to them, this is my body, which is given for you. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. In the same way, after they had eaten, he took the cup and he poured it out for them. And he said to them, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink it, drink it in remembrance of me. I'll ask the elders that were uh, supposed to be the stations to come up and we're going to have a station to my left, to my right. We'll have a station right here. And if you require a gluten-free option, that's going to be straight back from me right at the back of the worship center. As I've explained before at Living Water, we celebrate close communion, meaning that if you have a close and personal relationship, if you have confessed him as your Lord and Savior, then come and join this meal. We also have grapes available for those that uh, just aren't in that place at this moment. Come and receive a blessing from one of these elders. Come and receive a blessing from Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters in Christ, come for all things are ready. Amen.
the tangible ways that he asks us to respond. One of the tangible ways that he says, follow me, is with our tithes and our offerings. He sets a foundation and he says, 10% give back to me to remind yourself, to remind those around us that it is his anyways, that what we have is really by his hand alone. And so we're going to take our offering during this next song, and I'm going to remind you that we have an opportunity to give online. I'm going to remind you that you can simply text in and have your set up online bank account. And that number is right behind us for online giving. So uh, those that are going to take our offering during this next song, come up and take our offering for us. Let's sing together.
light into my life I will live for you alone You're the one I seek Knowing I will find All I need in you alone In you alone Where you go, I'll go Where you stay, I'll stay When you move, I'll move I will follow you Who you love, I'll love How you serve, I'll serve If this life I lose Christ today through words, through song, through scripture. Follow Jesus is our clear message today. If that's the first time you heard that, then go and pray in that back corner with friends and, and uh, brothers and sisters that are willing and able to pray for you and with you. Maybe if it's a recommitment, maybe if it's a reminder of what he has been tapping you on the shoulder with, then voice that out. Say that to someone. This is what God is calling me to. There's something powerful that happens when we speak what God is saying to each other. A couple of reminders for you. Don't forget, uh, what do they have to fill out? A blue card with your email address, with a prayer concern. Give that to me at the end of the service. Uh, give that to the people at the Welcome Center as well. And a couple of church life things that I want you to know about. Uh, number one, next week, November 10, we are going to have a huddle meeting. And we're going to hold it right back in the uh, jam room there in the area with all of the chairs. And so stay after the service, November 10 for just kind of a church life commitment understanding of what is happening and what we are doing. Uh, also, during that time, there's going to be no uh, jam or Sunday school small group or wave. And so plan ahead for that. And then long-term advancement, I want you to know about December 15. That's going to be our Christmas program. And that's going to be a time when the kids and Sue have a wonderful program set up for us. So mark your calendars for December 15. And I want to give you one huge invite. I said it on the Friday update. I want to let you know that we have that right now media thing happening, right? And that's like the Christian Netflix. I want you to be at home logging into that and using that. And what I found out, uh, Donna and I did a, a web chat with, uh, with our account representative. We have 72 people that are signed up and using that. That's awesome. Thank you so much for that. And I want to give an, another on-ramp to make sure that you have the availability to use that. And so what I'm going to put up there uh, is not only all of the things that you can access, you can access kids programming, you can access Bible studies, all of that. But right now, right here, right now, you have the availability to download it on your phone. Simply text right now, space, L-W-C-C-I to 41. 
411. And that will get you an invite for the Right Now Media uh, library, for everything that Right Now Media has. Last night we sat uh, as a family and we read through, or uh, excuse me, we watched a story of David and Goliath. And that's really what we're looking for, for an opportunity for you to sit with your family, for you to sit and watch this Netflix, this Christian Netflix, this understanding of everything that we have to offer through this Right Now Media library. So make sure you text that number or uh, text that statement to 41411. With all of that being said, I want to give you this blessing as you go, as you seek to follow Jesus by loving God and loving others. May the God of all grace, after you have suffered a little while, himself restore you and make you strong and firm and steadfast. Now unto him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.